Welcome to the very first episode of the Hunt Backcountry Podcast, presented by Exo Mountain Gear. In this episode, you'll meet the co-hosts, myself, Mark Hilsing, and my good buddy, Steve Speck. We introduce ourselves, we talk about why we hunt the backcountry, we talk about the top two or three gear items that matter most when it comes to hunting the backcountry effectively, we decide whether trekking poles are worth it, or whether they're just for mall walkers. We talk about Steve's 1.2 ounce ridiculous luxury item that he takes on every trip. We discuss a goal pack weight for a five day backpack hunt. And we talk about elk hunting, how to judge a bull's aggressiveness, and how to know when to make a move towards him or when to stay put and try and call him in. Hope you enjoy the episode. If you have any feedback, questions, or just want to get in touch, email us at podcast at exomountaingear.com. This podcast is something that Steve and I have talked about doing for a long time, and we finally decided we need to make it happen. I think it's kind of cool. I'm pretty new in terms of backcountry hunting. Steve has quite a bit of experience, so it's even a learning process for me. Along the way, we're going to have a ton of great interviews, talk about pretty much every topic in terms of backcountry hunting, and hopefully answer some of your questions. So I hope you guys have subscribed, join us, let us know what you want us to cover. We'd be happy to talk about it. In this first episode, we just kind of introduce ourselves. For the few of you that may know, I have a site called souladventure.com and have just documented how I've come really to learn as an elk hunter, specifically hunting the backcountry of Colorado. I'm from in the Midwest, so it's been a huge learning curve. If you're new to elk hunting or backcountry hunting, you might want to check that out. Steve, as we'll hear, he's been involved in hunting and really the industry for quite some time. So in this first episode, hope you enjoy it. Look forward to episode two with Steve's uh, business partner with Exo Mountain Gear, Lenny Nelson. I gotta say, I learned a ton in that episode. So, hope you guys enjoy, hang around, come back and check us out again. Well, welcome Steve to the first episode, how are you? I'm doing good, Mark, how you doing? Good. I heard you were out uh, running with your pup and getting in shape for September. Yeah, yeah. Got off of work about 6, went for a quick run, and here it is, 7.30, just sitting down to record the podcast with you. Nice. Is it still crazy hot up there? I was up there a couple weeks ago. It was just ridiculous. No, it's uh, it's actually, it was like the high today was 80, so you definitely missed... Uh, oh, perfect. <laughs> you missed that. So I brought the triple digit temperatures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. Oh, awesome. All right, well, for uh, those of you guys who are not aware, a uh, quick rundown of who the heck is Steve Speck. I um, started, uh, st- I, got, I own uh, SNS Archery, started that um, back in 2008, 2009. Um, since then, I started, developed Solid Broadhead Company. Uh, I did sell that to the outdoor group, uh, Elite Archery, back in 2010. Uh, then, uh, kind of same time as that, I uh, started uh, Pure Elevation Productions with my good friend and, and hunting partner, Lenny Nelson, um, and we... Together, we recently just uh, started Exo Mountain Gear, uh, which is the presenting sponsor of this podcast. Um, Absolutely. And uh, yeah, Lenny and I just had a, you know, just just like a lot of guys, got that bug, uh, you know, caught in us of, of hunting the backcountry and over the years of doing it, decided we wanted to develop a pack and kind of jumped all in, you know, not knowing what the heck or how we're going to do it, but, <laughs> you know, kind of one of those you figure it out as you go along the way. So um, that's, uh, that's really what this podcast is, is all about. Why we wanted to put it together was just share our love of the backcountry and, and talk to guys. And, um, you know, one of the, uh, one of my favorite things is, is just learning from other people. And so I'm yeah. really excited for the opportunity to, to get guys on here that, you know, everybody has their tips and tricks and things they do different. And, uh, I think is, you know, becoming better hunters, um, there's really not much more you can do, uh, you know, obviously just time in the field being smart, but talking sure. to other guys and, and learning from people that, uh, you know, maybe do it different or better or worse. And, um, yeah. yeah, so here we are. Yeah, that's awesome. Who are some uh, of those guys? Like if you were to list maybe, you know, a handful of guys that you've learned uh, important lessons from, who are some of those guys? Uh, man, you know, I asked, somebody asked me that question the other day and uh, I was like, I don't. 
I don't necessarily have like a, a specific idol out there yeah. of, you know, somebody that was like, oh man, you know, you're the guy I want to be someday. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, to be honest, it's just been a, a, a a bunch of different guys, you know, um, Len, hunting with Lenny, hunting with uh, Jason Wright, hunting with Tyler Crockett, all the guys that we do pure elevation with. You know, we all have our different styles, and and I, you know, we we always go back and forth, and you know, we're out there hunting and and just learning from each other. Um, you know, uh, Russ Meyer, he's a, a local Boise guy here who yeah. just he's like the um, he puts some oh, critters down for sure. Yeah, he puts some critters down. I'm trying to think of uh, who he's the, the – there's a – oh, gosh, I can't think of the guy's name right now. Uh, yeah. One of those famous hunters. <laughs> and he's he's like the equivalent of that that, you know, not that many people have heard of. I mean – Yeah. Uh, but uh, Russ is – he's just a, he's just a killer. That guy yeah, goes man. out and just I don't, every freaking trip, I don't know how he does it. Uh, so I've, I definitely got to become friends with Russ and pick his brain and see what he does. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think patience is the kind of the key word on that one. Yeah. Yeah. It was and, awesome to see, uh, for you listeners, if you haven't got to see it yet, this year's full draw film tour, uh, has mm-hmm. a film from Steven, the guys, but also has an awesome film from Russ, uh, a great elk hunt that he was on as well as his son, which was really, really cool to see. Absolutely. Yeah. That was pretty awesome. Uh, pretty awesome to capture on video. I mean, so much stuff out there is production, but you, you just can't fake Right. You can't fake real. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, real emotion. And, you know, I, I imagine Russ watching Russ kill his, uh, having his son kill his first bull right in front of him. That's got to be a pretty, uh, pretty special experience. Yeah, for sure. So, well, yeah, tonight uh, we just wanted to kind of get into um, introducing the podcast and then just talk about backcountry hunting in general. Specifically, though, why do we hunt the backcountry? I mean, so what is it for you, Steve? I mean, there's a lot of different ways to hunt out there and obviously with you in Idaho um you know getting away from the crowds and everything else uh Mm -hmm. lends you to the backcountry but what what really keeps you uh coming back to backcountry hunting regardless of what animal you're after yeah you know I've definitely tried to answer that question a handful of times and to to pin it in on one single thing is pretty hard um I am definitely uh my own term I made is I'm an experience hunter and right. and I'm not, I'm not out there necessarily hunting the biggest buck on the mountain. I just want the coolest experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the back country lends itself to that. So I've you know said it before and, and I hope this never changes my mentality, but I would much rather shoot a 150 inch buck up at 10,000 feet backpacked in there than a 200 inch deer out in the desert on some tag that you got lucky and drew and you yeah. know spotted them off your four-wheeler because it's flat country I, it's just you know to each their own that's just not for me right um i love i don't know there's just something something about the backcountry something about just leaving your truck um the, the simplicity I, I just love that yeah i love just grabbing my backpack and throwing it in the back seat of my truck and that's all i need Right. Everything you need to live, survive, have a great time is right there. Um, you know, I, I always chuckle when I see the, you know, I probably blow by past the guy driving up the highway going hunting and he's got his trailer and it's <laughs> 30 feet long. He's got his another trailer behind it with two four wheelers and just, yeah. you know, loaded up with gear like he's freaking moving his house. <laughs> and, you know, someday when I, I'm sure we'll have kids and we'll be able to backpack and, and you know, that's going to be an awesome experience. But right now, uh, while I can, backpacking's it for me. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. You know, it's yeah. funny with with me being from the Midwest. It's obviously not a super common thing still for you know as I'm running into hunters here for them to really even get what it takes to like go out west and hunt. And mm-hmm. it is. It's one of those things. It's it's hard to put in words, um, in one way how hard it can be, but at the same time how rewarding it is. And I think that's part of what it is for me. Um, just cause it's a year long, you know, pursuit and process to, you know, to get gear together, to run through things, to, you know, make sure you're in decent shape and, you know, doing scouting, um, and just all kinds of things. It's just, it's so rewarding, um, to get out there and do it regardless really of what your success is like. I mean, I think if you go out there and you're, like you said, you go, you got your pack, you're on your own, you're self-sufficient. 
it's just really rewarding to go make that type of trip regardless of of what happens absolutely yeah yeah i could not agree more there's something that the probably the best feeling in the world is you got 120 pounds in that pack and as miserable as that pack out is the second you <laughs> get to your truck drop the tailgate freaking slam down on that thing yeah um i don't know that's uh I just love it. I got a spill smile on my face right now just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, same here. It's funny you say that. We were uh, on the Elk Peck out last year. My buddy Jared and I, we were, you know, about the same. We had a full bowl split between us with one one trip. And, you know, I, I was doing pretty good. It was one of those things where, you know, having a good partner is so important. In the beginning of the pack out, I really kind of had to carry him. And then near the end, I mean, he totally had to carry me and push me to the truck. And mm-hmm. I was just exhausted and it's one of those things I was so happy to get there. But it was, uh, before we got there, I said, if there's anybody in this parking lot or at this trailhead, I just don't want to see him. I don't want to talk to him. You know, I was just done. Yeah. It would have been, you know, 14 hour <laughs> right. day. I was just done. And, uh, sure enough, we get back and there's two dudes like, Hey, what'd you get? And wanted the whole story <laughs> and Jared's all chipper and talking. I'm like, dude, get in the truck. Let's go. I just wanted some food. I want to get out of there. Yeah. That's so funny. That a beer and a hamburger at the end of that trip is always pretty rewarding as well. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly what we did. So awesome. one question I get a lot, Steve, again, cause I kind of have, uh, at least through my website, an audience of guys who are from the East, from the Midwest in are new to hunting the backcountry and going out west. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe they've done it once or twice, or maybe they're going for their first time. I get so many emails um, from guys. And I think one of the things, you know, guys are always asking about gear. Um, you know, they're asking about scouting or, you know, elk hunting tactics or calling or, you know, whatever the thing is. But one thing a guy rarely asks about is just how to handle the backcountry in general. And I think what I'm getting at is the the mental aspect of it. Um, right. And I think there's guys who are well-suited to that and guys who aren't. I mean, have you run into that with, with other guys that you talk to? Um, yeah, definitely. It's just a, it's a, it's a mind shift. It's, it's, it's not going to be easy and it's not, uh, we jokingly, I mean, in the middle of every hunt, as much as I love being back there, I'm wishing I'm back in town drinking a beer and eating that hamburger. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. It just, it is. There's nothing easy about it. Um, it, it's, it's funny. I, I spend, you know, 11 months out of the year, 10 months, whatever it is, dreaming about being back there. And then I'm back there. And, yeah. uh, you know, after a couple of days, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get out and drink a beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so I actually, I, I guess I personally struggle with like just, uh, just settling in and, and relaxing. You know, we did, uh, Jason Wright and I went to Wyoming last year and spent eight days back there. We came out for a day. We packed out my buck on Wednesday and got out at like two o'clock and three hours later we were hiking back in to go hunt for him. So we did come out for a day, but, yeah. um, oh yeah, um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah. But just being out there for that long, I mean, eight days yeah, is oh, a pretty long time. Yeah, so being out there for eight days, you actually kind of got into a groove. Most of our trips, I mean, we just kind of do, uh, you know, they're two to four, you know, sometimes five day trips. Right. We're just kind of glorified weekend warriors. Mm-hmm. Head out, leave our work early on a Thursday, and get home Sunday night, or you know, so stuff like that. Right. Um, try to take advantage of a few of the weekdays to avoid, you know, running into other guys. So sure. Um, which is going back to your, one of your questions about why we hunt the backcountry i kind of probably the main reason to get back there was to find better hunting um that was my first original motivation you know we yeah i grew up uh grew up i I didn't start start really hunting until i was 18 but from like 18 to 22 23 you know we just kind of hunted just typical you know had a big bat big base camp with trailers and stuff like that and and just kind of would drive like half an hour from that camp and hunt and we hunted hard right Um, i actually think you probably hunt harder doing it that way because you do a lot of, um, you know, you're hiking. You, we we right. do a morning hunt and cover four or five miles of country and come out and go back to camp at noon and then go back in for the evening and, you know, backpack and you're just kind of hunting all day and it's much slower pace. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so that, you know, the hunting back then was was tough. You know, it would be if in a three-day weekend we, we got into one group of elk, that was awesome, yeah. you know. 
uh, and now backpacking, it's like if we go a couple hours without getting into elk, we're, you know, we're disappointed. So, yeah. um, it's, uh, it's just, you know, that was, that was the main reason to get started. And then, um, I guess like it's a funny story. My very first trip ever, um, was solo, you know, I freaking just didn't know what I was doing, had no clue. Um, <laughs> so might as well do it by yourself, right? <laughs> yeah. Might as well do it by myself. But the guy, and I was stupid. I think I was like seven miles in, I was going elk hunting. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just picked a spot on a ridge and I was like, I'm going to hike that ridge all the way to that point. And, and then, uh, and I didn't look that far. And I think that was like, I, I would not even. I was just probably just starting using Google Earth. I didn't even know you could measure distance or something on it. Yeah. And then I, I ended up doing it later and found out it was like seven miles, fourteen in <laughs> or smokes. fourteen round. Which you know, first trip, that's a good trip. And uh, yeah. But I, I literally, I, I lasted one night. I was going to go in for three. I lasted one night. I, I went in, and and I chickened out, man. That I packed a pistol with me. I had that sucker like I had like. <laughs> I must have had some deer outside the tent in the middle of the night, you know, and I had that pistol in my freaking hand. And That's <laughs> I was, funny. Uh, I woke up the next morning and, and hunted for a few hours, but didn't see that many elk. And I was just like, screw it. I'm getting out of here. You know, I don't want to stay back here. Yeah. But I had literally caught the bug. I mean, I, I have that, that very specific memory. Before, for, I, By the time I decided to leave that trip, before I'd gotten to the truck, I was already planning my trip, my return trip. That's awesome. Like I, I, I that's a, a very distinct memory in my head of, I knew I was going back. It was, you know, it was done. So, yeah. Um, and now, and now, I, I don't hunt solo too many trips. You know, I mean, it's, it's. I like to get like one or two in a year. Um, if you've never done that, it's a whole another level of, of, uh, of that. You talk about that mental side. For sure. Anybody that can go spend four, five, six, seven nights, whatever, in the in the backcountry by themselves i, I give you know, yeah. kudos to them because it's not it's not easy to do yeah like four or five you, days solo doesn't sound long till you actually start to do it <laughs> oh yeah yeah and if the hunting's slow and you got your wife and kids at home you know that yeah. those temptations definitely uh kind of grab you so yeah. yeah yeah that's interesting i bring that up mainly because you know i think so many guys just they're not planning for that and i want to put it right. but i want to put that on people's radar it's okay that you go through that because everybody yeah. will. Um, yeah. but you just got to, A, you got to know it's coming. And then B, you just got to know, you got to just got to push through it. I mean, that's all there is to it. Um, mm-hmm. Whether it's a mental challenge because the hunting's slow or you're just missing home or whatever. Like if you're truly going to go in the backcountry and commit to hunting there, you just have to be prefer- prepared for those mental battles for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, But again, that leads back to why it's so rewarding on the other side. Exactly. Yeah. Once you come through it and you and you come out the other side successful, it's man. I don't know. There's nothing better. Yeah. Nothing better. All right. Well, speaking of it, we're gonna we're gonna have all kinds of episodes focused on gear and all kinds of you know tactics mm-hmm. and things in the future. But just want to hit just a few questions while we have you. Um, what are the top two to three um, items that you feel make the biggest difference in one's ability to hunt the backcountry more effectively? Um, yeah, that, that answer is pretty simple. A, a good boot, a good pair of boots and a good pack. Yeah. Uh, those are the two things I, I feel like if you got a cheaper, heavy sleeping bag or tent or a water filter, that's not good, you know, or that, that pumps water slow, whatever you can deal um, with it. You can deal with it. You cannot deal with, with your feet, with blisters and pain. I mean, that just, that can make a, an easy trip into a very, very hard trip. Yeah. And then, and then your pack is you, you got to think of that almost as your vehicle, right? right. That is without a, a, the ability to carry your gear efficiently and comfortably. And then at the same time to be able to get that meat out of the back country, because there's no other way to do it, but strap it to your back and carry it out. Yep. And to be able to do that comfortably as comfortable as possible. We all know it. A hundred pound load over six miles sucks. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, to do that as comfortably as possibly, or as comfortable as possible. Um, that's uh, those are the two things that I'm just like. Don't skimp on a good pair of boots and a good pack. Yeah. And definitely when you get your, you know, when you get one or both, um, you know, break them in, use them, get used to them, get familiar. Uh, those are those are the major ones. Like I said, that headlamps. I'm, I got my gear list pulled up in front of me. You know, my trekking poles and headlamps and knives and tent and backpacking stove and sleeping pad. I mean, all that stuff. Um, you know, there, there's so many options out there and, and, uh, and you can go kind of cheaper and if you want to go ultra light, you know, 
it took me years of just chipping away at, you know, one year I'd buy a nice sleeping bag and the next year I'd buy a nice tent and right. you know, it was just kind of a process to get there. But the, the two things is that if you're out east, coming back west for the first time or you're living out west and you want to go start backpacking, uh, invest in, in boots because I, I say boots, but boots should really be shoes because I, I just wear hiking shoes. Yeah. Um, but uh, a good pair of shoes, boots, and pack. Yeah. You mentioned trekking poles. I'm curious just to hear your thoughts on them. Uh, not a, oh. to get into a specific model, but do you think they're necessary? Do you think they're required? Do you think pretty much everybody who's backcountry hunting uh, so, should use them? You know, definitely. Um, this kind of lends to a whole another topic conversation of <laughs> of uh, my gear list and kind of the evolution of it. And it's it's just this constantly changing thing. Of every year, there's one or two items that leave and one or two items that come in. Yeah. Um, more, most recently, last few years, I started tripod mounting my binos and that to me was like just this night and day difference. Uh, yeah. It was amazing. Uh, and then last year, actually, I started using trekking pole for the first time. Really? I always, yeah. I, mean, I didn't I was, realize that. Yeah. Last year was the first year. I had never done it. Uh, I'd heard of guys doing it and the guys that did it swore by it. Yeah. Uh, I think Lenny had, he had used them on one trip and then that was it. Like he, had, I think he lost one of them and stopped packing it. Um, and, uh, the, the only reason I started doing it was I got that, uh, I have a pro master tripod, the XC five, two, five C. Um, I sell it on SNS archery, but, uh, I'd gotten it. It was a new model and the one leg, uh, unscrews to become a monopod. And uh, when I cool. saw that, I was like, Oh, that is brilliant. That yeah. could be, a, that could be my tent pole. And I was like, Oh, it could also be a trekking pole. And then, man, one trip, I just pulled that thing out and started using it, and holy crap, it's it's pretty awesome. I mean, it, to to me, there's times when I just carry it, right? Like, or if I just collapse it up and throw it in my pack or just screw it back on the tripod. Um, but there's also times like technical terrain. Um, that te- technical terrain definitely is it's nice. It just gives you an extra foot, basically. Yeah. You know, if if you slip and fall, just one more thing to catch you. Um, and uh, and then heavy heavy weight, um, even on flat terrain, it's super nice. Yeah, uh, it's a massive difference. Yeah, with, it, with it, packing out, it really is. Um, I uh, it, it really really is. Yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. And then uh, um, let's see, the technical terrain, packing heavy loads, and I keep I was losing my train of thought. Yeah, yeah, I and noticed it, for me, it, like I'll be the guy that. I'll pack in with them and then I might leave them as we're hunting a day or two. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But man, I, I tried going some of our pack out last year without my poles and I just Mm -hmm. like, I, I I wanted them back right away. I mean, if, if for nothing else, like if, if you were to take them and strap them on your pack and just leave them at camp or leave them strapped to your pack the entire time, Mm -hmm. personally, I think it'd be worth carrying them for five or six days if you did nothing else but use them to, pack out after you're successful yeah like i'm not a fan of carrying dead weight but like they're that they make that big of a difference at least for me with packing out heavy weight yeah they really do they take i i I don't know how much basically stress off your knees too because that's going to be the most painful part going downhill with that the other thing i was going to say earlier was climbing it's just kind of like it's like putting a bar in front of you that you can grab onto and pull yourself up yeah i could definitely climb like steeper technical terrain more efficiently with the trekking pole. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've noticed that quite a bit. It's it's nice. Yeah. So, yeah, highly suggest the trekking pole. Cool. So I know you're a pretty lightweight guy. Is there one like comfort food luxury item you bring? Or are you pretty pared down now or you're just sticking with the essentials? Uh, I'm pretty pared down. I like you'll laugh like about something I consider a luxury item is I've got somewhere along. I was going on a fishing trip. I stopped into Walmart and bought a pillow and <laughs> it's just like this little 10 inch by 18 inch pillow case that was around this inflatable pillow and uh-huh. I did, and it's it's fleece I packed that thing it weighs like 1.2 ounces or something <laughs> you got uh, 1.2 ounce yeah that's my uh, that's my luxury splurge um and I just throw like my puppy jacket and extra clothes that I have with me in that and that's my pillow for the night so I can't not go with a pillow um and I've tried just like rolling my clothes up into a ball but eventually they just kind of in the middle of the night gets you know pushed all around the tent and whatever. So, yeah. uh, pillow. And then, you know, the jet boil, um, stove, there's lighter options out there. Um, I just, the jet boil is so efficient. 
Um, you know, I just had a guy ask me about it the other day because he's an ultralight uh, guy and, and he knew I used a chip boy. I was like, why do you use that? You know, you could use this MSR Giga stove and little cup, you know, it's always five and a half ounces. Or yeah, all kinds yeah, of, those yeah. Esbit stoves, there's right. so many things out there. Um, and I was just like, I, one, I'm a huge coffee drinker. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll probably have three or four cups throughout the day, you know, two in the morning and one at, you know, like 10, 11 and one in the evening. Uh, and the jet boil is just awesome for that. Um, the efficiency of, of obviously just, I've never found anything that boils water that fast. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then the, the one thing, the argument for the jet boil as far as lightweight is because it's so efficient, you don't use that much fuel. So yeah. on a trip, I used to have this Brunton, I want to say Raptor stove. I'd have to look, it's been years. Um, and I, and on a three day trip, I'd burn through a whole, uh, fuel canister one of the small ones um, that's so I'd crazy pack in a few too. days yeah i mean it, it that thing just blew through fuel canisters yeah, so anything longer stuff. than you know uh, really anything more like a three full day trip i would have to pack fuel canisters an extra one um uh, and then all of a sudden that offsets the weight of the jet oil so mm -hmm. um but those yeah so jet oil and uh pillowcase are, are really my two luxury things you know there, this the cool thing is there's so many great light options out there now that you don't have to sacrifice um comfort necessarily right um to to be lightweight you know like the uh, i use that thermarest neoware trekking or uh, the thermarest neoware sleeping pad and the other thing weighs 12 ounces and it's two and a half inches thick it's 20 by 72 it's kind of tapered at the, it's not a mummy cut but it's tapered at the corners and you know, that thing is awesome. I sleep like a baby on that, especially with a couple Tylenol PMs. That's critical. <laughs> that's the secret sauce, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the secret sauce. Uh, I would not sleep without that. But, uh, um, you know, that's, that's a perfect example. of It's a 12-ounce sleeping pad. That's that's unheard of 10 years ago, you know? Yeah. Um, but it, it's it's as comfortable as, you know, you're going to expect. So, yeah. uh, and my sleeping bag weighs one pound, six ounces. Uh, I also started using a quilt last year that weighs 14 ounces. That seems awesome when it's going to be like 30 and above. Yeah. Uh, even tents, you know, you're sub two pounds for a full on shelter. Uh, there's there's so many good options out there that you don't have to sacrifice too much, um, you know, too much comfort. So, yeah. but the, you know, I run into guys still to this day that, you know, like, Hey, I'm going for the weekend. I get my packs 55 pounds and I, I would actually love for one of those guys to bring a pack over and just kind of tear that apart because, Right. I guarantee twenty of it is just just excess crap or you know, the the for the what ifs, you know, they're gonna pack a whole f full kit of rain gear and even though the temperatures are probably gonna be thirty to ninety, you know, like yeah. to me I'll just I'll just get wet and if it rains or huddle up under a tree or pitch my tent. Yeah. Um, you know. So Yeah, I think it's an important note. I mean a lot of guys will have recess of, you know, having a very lightweight tent or a very lightweight X, Y, or Z. Yeah. But, you know, the, the best way to save weight is to not bring something. And so, you know, <laughs> as good as it is to, like, go lightweight right. on an item, just make sure you're not bringing a bunch of extra junk. Absolutely. Yeah, you know? 100% agree. Yeah. It's... And then, too, you always got that weight that you're uh, you're carrying on your body. You might want to, you know, try and keep that in check, too. You know, <laughs> I've been there. Uh, that, one's, that one's harder for most people, myself included, than yeah. uh, than it is to go to REI or whatever and buy a super lightweight. Tent. Dude, I'm with you. I hear you. Uh, what so i know that you're like i would say very ultra light although i know there's mm -hmm. uh lighter in terms of non-hunting folks out there but you know not a super ultra light guy but what's do you have like a guideline of maybe where a guy should try to be for let's say a five-day hunt like a five-day elk hunt september not accounting for some you know crazy mm -hmm. horrible weather mm -hmm. um What's like a benchmark for you would say just a regular no, like trying I mean, to get here? Uh, if you're if you're under forty, you're doing pretty good. Yeah, um, I would say, you know, that if you're just like if, like if that's your first trip out, um, and or you know you're just getting started, you know, forty pounds is that's a good benchmark. Yeah, um, to hit, like you know, I'd be probably. 24 25 pounds on a five-day trip something like that now is that dry is that without food or was that with food um that would be without water i never I, water. I never i guess I, I never understand why people include water in that because it's i could have consumable yeah it's consumable i could have two liters uh or three or five liters full of water if i got my 
extra bladder and my bladder full and I can have zero. So yeah. um, I never include water and I usually, you know, unless I know the, if I know the country, I'll, I won't, like if I know, heck we're hiking along a, a river for the first five miles right. and I'm not, not going to pack that extra water. I'll just write it before we start climbing up the hill or something to leave the water source. I'll just fill up. So, yeah. Um, a lot of guys will probably fill up at the trailhead. You know, if you're going to a new country, that's obviously smart because we've all been there before. You just, man, you just can't find water. We have had that happen way too many times. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, that's a good guideline. I would say, um, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good number. I mean, for somebody, I'm not as ultralight as you, um, A, because I don't have as much experience, and B, because I just haven't invested in as quality of gear. You know, I can pull off, uh, like, we, we pack for a week when we go elk hunting because, you know, we're we're in there and we're coming from out of state. And with food, water, and fuel, I can still keep it at, like, 40 pounds. Um, so for those of you guys who, like, want a middle of the road, I mean, my pack list is uh, on my site, soldadventure.com forward slash elk. I'll get you right to it. And then Steve's, I know that... Uh, we're gonna have yours up here uh, real soon, maybe even up by the time of this podcast at the Pure yeah. Elevation site, which is pure-elevation.com. So go ahead and check that out if you want to see uh, Steve's list or then my list on Soul Adventure. So awesome! Yeah. So one uh, one final question. Let's get in one sort of tip and tactic uh, with elk hunting. And again, mm-hmm. we're gonna have all kinds of future episodes on this, but. I know there's no one answer to this, but it's something that I wrestle with and something that I get questions about a lot is if you have a bull that's bugling, um, how do you personally gauge whether you need to be the aggressive one, make the move, close the distance, uh, continue to call, or if you can kind of sit back, uh, let him come to you and then maybe draw him in with your calls? Like, how do you play those situations or how do you read a bull and then you know, choose your strategy accordingly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'd love to, we'll have to get like uh Corey Jacobson or something on here for one of these episodes. Yeah. And there's no one that, answer too. I know yeah, it changes, yeah. but like sort um, of what's your thought process like yeah, on I'm, each encounter? Yeah, like I said, the, every one is different. Um, I'm always air on the side of aggressive. Yeah. Um, Cause when I first started, I was very timid and that just doesn't, doesn't work i mean very few bulls if you hang up at 300 yards or 200 yards and you sit back there and try calling or bugling you know uh they're probably just going to take their cows and leave so a lot of that you you, that that question probably should be based around the the time of year um you know opening weekend you have a great chance like that's a that's a great time to be sitting there just cow calling and hang out for an hour get in a spot where you got good shooting lanes and good thermals and just hang out because you might have a bull close by and he will, you know, he's not going to come running in, you know, if he's 400 yards away, it may take him half an hour to get there, but he'll just kind of mosey his way over and check you out. Um, around the 13th, 14th, usually here in Idaho, at least seems to be a transition of bulls are definitely not in bachelor groups anymore. They've, they're rubbed up They're They're ready to, you know, they're it's, it's like go time, right? Yep. You know, the night before the big fight, that's a great time to kill a big bull and a great time to be uh, aggressive, I think. of If you could get a bull that is really responding and firing up, um, I think you could really kind of get in his face and, and you know, he's kind of, the hormones are starting to kick in and all that, and you, know, you, you got a really good chance to call on that bull. Um, where I really struggle with, and, and I, I'd say a good portion of, of elk hunters do, is you get to like September, September 25th and that bull has got his 10, 15 cows. Yeah. It is very, very, very hard to get him to leave those cows. It's, yeah. I hate, I hate hunting at the end of the month. Most people like, uh, you know, it's exciting, right? I mean, the bulls are bugling every time you freaking call, you know, you cow call, you, he'll bugle, you bugle, he bugles, but they're hard to kill. Uh, yeah. One, cause there's, you know, 15 sets of eyes instead of just the one that there was earlier in the month. Um, and two, he, he's, you know, that was some of the things I struggled with on, uh, early on elk hunting was I'd get a bull bugle in and we'd bugle back and forth. We'd probably be like 300, 400 yards away and, you know, he'd get all fired up and then you're thinking, oh man, this is going to happen. And then the next bugle you hear, he's 600 yards away and yeah. then he's 800 yards away and then, then you can't even hear him anymore. So, 
Um, as a general rule, I, I try to be as, as aggressive as possible and as quiet as possible until I don't, I, until I'm in position. So yeah. say if we pop up on a ridge, it's first thing in the morning, we let out a bugle, we hear a bull bugle, uh, and, and I think he's 400 yards down there. You know, we're going to check the thermals. If he's down below us, we're going to drop down, get inside hill to him. And we're going to do our absolute best to get within 100 yards. And that can be very, very hard to do. Um, you know, some sometimes a bull sounds like he's 200 yards away and he's really 100 because maybe there's a lot of trees and he's facing the other way. And then right. you know, sometimes it, it, it's really hard to gauge. And it, that that's there's nothing you can do there but just experience. Um, you know, and we're wrong constantly. We're wrong way more than we're right about where that bull was. Um, so, but I but I always err on the side of aggression. I will. I'd rather bump that bull than sit too far back and have him take off with his cows. So yeah, um, and, I, and I've had better luck doing that um, for sure. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I know other guys. Um, uh, another guy I uh, really respect is an elk hunter. His name's Charlie. Um, he'll he'll sit on that ridge and he'll he'll hike that thing back and forth until um, he finds a bull that is. And when you hear a bull that's fired up, there, there's a big difference between an old bull that's answering your call and a bull that's just, just that throaty, just, you know, he's just pissed. Yeah. Um, and when you hear that one, that should get you excited. But, you know, they're, they're not often. Usually that's going to be um, later in the month and it's still going to be hard to kill, but he, he you got a good chance to kill that bull. Um, so anyways, he I think he, he kind of just, his motto is cover country until he finds that one bull. Like if he hears a bull that just kind of squeals, um, you know, it probably sounds like a raghorn, so maybe he's not too interested in it. Um, but he'll he'll run back and forth and find that bull, that one bull that he can tell is is primed and ready to go, and then he'll go, then he'll get aggressive and drop down in there. So I think I tend to, um, you know, the second I hear a bull, I'm I'm, I'm probably just going to shut up and get as close as I can, call him in, and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, that's a great answer. Then, I mean. Yeah, I've uh, as one who's learning to elk hunt. I mean, I've begun to learn that lesson because I think you know, being a new elk hunter, man. When I heard a bull call, a I just kind of wanted to call back. Like I wanted to play the game, mm-hmm. right? I wanted to participate. It was just exciting, but mm-hmm. it was, you know, it's probably stupid. Um, and I've had yeah. plenty of encounters where it's like, yeah, I'm calling back, and maybe he even answers, but so what? Because he's not coming. But right. as a new elk hunter, you don't realize that for a while. Um, yeah. And I, I totally agree, man. If you can pinpoint at least the direction he's at and then hopefully get an idea of distance, um, man, just go to him. I think especially, again, if a guy's coming from Midwest or out East, you know, it's just a different ball game. Like, don't worry about every little noise. Don't worry about every little thing. Just go and get there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, if, exactly like you said, if you can get in within 100 yards, really, I mean, ideal even a little bit closer if you can call from you know his back door while you're stepping on his toes even if he does have some cows you're you're going to get a reaction for sure absolutely yeah yeah awesome yeah that's good well thanks for joining us tonight steve it's been a good show um as i mentioned we have a bunch of guests coming up going to be interviewing some great guys from the industry and one thing for sure is we want your feedback so Go ahead and e- email us at podcast at Exo Mountain Gear. Um, and then if you can give us some feedback uh, or even ideas for a guest you want to see on the episode, a question you want answered, a topic you want covered, we'd love to hear that feedback at that email address, podcast at exomountaingear.com. And then if you're listening to this through iTunes or another means, go ahead and leave us a review if you're enjoying it. What we're going to do is each episode we will be picking a uh, somebody that emails us, you know, some feedback or an idea or leaves us a review and uh, we'll be picking one of you guys out and sending you some exo swag. And then when we get the ball rolling here a little bit with this podcast, we're actually going to be doing a pack giveaway. So you're certainly going to want to stay tuned and check that out. You can always find these episodes at exomountaingear.com forward slash podcast. And thanks for joining us. 